Welcome back, my friends, to today's episode of Everyday Truth. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit echoey uh, in the room today. I'm in the Cool Beans coffee shop at the Wilds uh, Christian Camp. Some of you have been here. I've got a nice fire going behind me, and I'm all by myself with my cup of coffee and you. So thanks for joining. We are today, uh, unfortunately, I feel as if we're saying goodbye to an old friend because we're completing Romans chapter 9 today. But remember, uh, in the Word of God, there were no chapter divisions. So really, as we continue our study and launch into the familiar chapter 10, we're going to see just how beautifully all of the faith references in Romans chapter 10 find context in what we've learned in Romans chapter 9. It fits together so beautifully and so seamlessly, and I can't wait to get there. And it actually gets introduced today. So we're at the end of Romans 9, and the Apostle Paul, having made his case that God's promises are sure and his faithful, faithfulness to them is intact, in spite of some of these objections, in spite of the fears of some of the Jews that, well, has God not been faithful to his promise? And Paul has said, listen, a God has been ultimately faithful to his promises. And it's the fact that God has been faithful and has pushed his plan forward by mercy that we're even here today. If it were not for God, we would be like Sodom and Gomorrah, be totally wiped out because we have not as a people group, Paul speaking for the nation of Israel, we have not been as a people group faithful to God, but God has advanced his plan forward by his promise, not by our right because of our lineage or not because of our good works. Uh, certainly that has not been an indication uh, of our faithfulness, but his promise and the keeping of it has been a, an indication of his faithfulness. So we, we've talked about how God, God demonstrated that through the patriarchs and how God demonstrated that during the time of the Exodus and how God demonstrated that even through the prophets, all of them. But the cited prophets here were Hosea and Isaiah. We talked about that last episode. But today, we see how the Apostle Paul wraps all of this into a beautiful conclusion for his audience. Remember, he's making the case that God is completely within the scope of his plan and then within the scope of his character to include the Gentiles, uh, to include the believing Jews and believing Gentiles as children of Abraham. And how? How, how is God justified to do that? Because it is God's work, it is God's promise, and we enter into that work and we enter into that promise by faith, by believing what God said. It's not by works. It's not by law adherence. It's not by lineage, but it's by faith. We are all children of God by faith of Jesus Christ. He made that case to the Galatians so beautifully. Neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And that's the great teaching here of Romans chapter 9, that there's this wonderful inclusivity that God has given to Jew and to Gentile, to old and young and rich and poor and male and female and bond and free, that there is salvation in Jesus Christ free and clear for all those that will receive him by faith. I feel so bad for some of our hardlined Calvinist friends who have so twisted, I think, this passage that they've even come up with weird things like, well, even faith, even man can't even exercise faith because even faith is a work, which is absolutely foreign to the entire teaching of Romans. Because in all the book of Romans, the the uh, the antonyms that the Apostle Paul uses is faith is the opposite of works. Uh, faith is the, and it's so faith is not a work, it's the opposite of works, as we shall see in the verses that we'll talk about today. So look at Romans 9, 
and verse number 30, where in typical Pauline fashion, he asks a question, probably the kind of question that he's been receiving in his ongoing ministry uh, among the Jews and others. And, And watch the question, Romans 9 and verse 30. What shall we say then? So so how do we piece all this together? We've talked about a whole lot of things this chapter. So what conclusion should we make? Now, if we would adopt the Calvinist interpretation of Romans 9, then this is a a slam dunk for the Apostle Paul. What shall we say then? Oh, here's what we'll say. Uh, God has chosen some people, uh, regardless of their choices, uh, to be saved. And he has chosen uh, some people, regardless of their choices, uh, to be damned, and there's nothing that people can do about it, and it's just God's pleasure to do so, and that's it. But that's not what Paul says. What shall we say then? So what, what is the conclusion of all of this? How does this practically apply to the situation at hand? where the Jews were thinking, we've kind of been kicked out to the curb. The Gentiles are receiving salvation. Did God keep his promises? Where's the faithfulness of God? How does this all work? Well, Paul's going to coalesce all of it right now. Look at verse number 30. What should we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness. So here's the, here's the, here's the group of Gentiles. Uh, they weren't given the law. Remember Romans chapter 3? The law was the unique property and stewardship responsibility of the Jews. And the Gentiles didn't have the law. They had conscience in Romans chapter 2, but they didn't have the law. And they weren't pursuing righteousness by the law. They were living their heathen, pagan, godless lives. So look at verse number 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness. So how did these people that weren't by their works and by their intentions seeking righteousness, how now, how now then have they become righteous? And of course, we know the answer because we've read Romans 3 and Romans 4. We've read Romans 5. They've received the righteousness which has been declared to them, which has been imputed to them, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Remember? The gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. So the righteousness, which is ours as believers, the righteousness of Jesus himself is not a righteousness we earn. It's not a righteousness that no matter how much we want it or we seek for it or we work for it, we'll never obtain. Because except our righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. We shall in no wise enter into the kingdom. No, the point is that righteousness as a goal is impossible. But when we come by faith uh, to God through Jesus Christ, we receive the gift righteousness of Jesus as a consequence of our response of faith to the work that he has done, to the work that he has fulfilled to the law that he has kept, that you and I never could have kept. So watch how it goes on to say that here. So the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. They're believing, because faith is what activates uh, and assimilates the promises of God. It's the way by which God's promises become mine. Uh, I seize them, I claim them by faith. Look at verse number 31. But Israel, so now the Gentiles, we saw them in verse 30, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness. Oh, they did have the law. The law was specifically given to them. Remember the oracles of God? We talked about that in Romans 3. They did receive the law. And therefore, they erroneously thought, although God never told them this, they erroneously thought that, We have the law, we need to keep the law, and if we can keep the law, then we can have righteousness. But somewhere down the line, they got this fallacious idea that the law was a means of salvation, that somehow they could keep the law, that somehow they could measure up, that somehow by their own good works and by their own efforts, they could be right with God, have a right standing with God. Of course, we know that's not true. That was never the purpose of the law. 
Uh, the law came way after the promise of, of Abraham, way after the promise of God. The law was added, Galatians chapter 3, because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And so the law was never given to be a means of righteousness. No, it's a standard of righteousness against which, when we look at ourselves, we realize that we are unrighteous. So the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law was there to show us that we are not holy, that we need uh, the promise of God, that we need the, the mercy of God, and that we have to have uh, the righteousness that, that is a gift from Christ. Otherwise, we would have no righteousness. So the law should have been the greatest megaphone in the lives of the Jews to show them, you do not measure up. You need Christ, which is why God, when he gave them the law, also gave them all the multifarious details of the sacrificial system. Ever wonder about that, Mount Sinai? God didn't just give Moses the law, but he gave him the means by which by faith, they would realize uh, the law condemns us. The law shows us how wicked we are. But we have, these sac we have this sacrificial system, all of which points to the mediatorship of the coming Messiah. And we have to sacrifice these lambs and we have to shed this blood. See, God had built in already through his Levitical law uh, a system whereby they could understand we are not righteous but God, through the sacrifice of the sinless one, has provided for us righteousness that we never could have earned. So how is righteousness uh, assimilated uh, for the Jew and the Gentile? By faith. For the Old Testament Jew, it was faith in what God would do as typified in the sacrificial system. Uh, for us that look back at Calvary, both Jews and Gentiles alike, it's seeing how God fulfilled the gift righteousness that he has provided for us. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ at, by looking at the cross, by looking at the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But watch what it says in verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. They want it so badly, but they don't, they're not getting what they're looking for. Why? Look at it, verse number 30, 32. Wherefore, why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. They stumbled at that stumbling stone. And one final time, the apostle Paul quotes Isaiah chapter eight. And watch what he says. By the way, Peter quoted the same verse in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8. Look at verse number 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion, that's a metonymy for Jerusalem, a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There it is, my friends. Jesus is either that at which you stumble or that whom he whom you receive. Only two choices, to accept him or to reject him. And Paul said, the Jews, they have not attained righteousness. Why? Because the only means of righteousness, Jesus, the very fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, the very fulfiller of the Old Testament law, their Messiah, they've rejected him. They've stumbled at him. Why? He's a rock of offense. Remember what Paul told the Galatians? He said, the gospel is an offense. In what way? It offends our human pride. You mean to tell me that I'm unrighteous? You mean to tell me that there's none good, no, not one? You mean to tell me I've fallen short of the glory of God? You mean to tell me that all my privileges mean nothing? You mean to tell me that I'm lost and dying and going to hell? You mean to tell me that I need to repent and put faith in, in, in Jesus? Yes. The gospel offends my pride. It offends my status. But unless I'm willing to humble myself and invest faith in Jesus Christ, I have no hope. So what's the, conclu what's the conclusion? The conclusion is here's salvation. Wrapped up in the embodiment of Jesus himself, we can believe whom God said he was, the incarnate God, the son of God who died for the sins of the world, 
Or we can stumble at that and say, no, no, I'll do it my own way. I'll, I'll keep my own uh, law. I'll, I'll do my best. I'll... The Jews were stumbling, not realizing that Jesus, that stone they disregarded, was really the cornerstone, wasn't he? And he is the one that they needed to come back and believe on. That's why Paul told the Corinthians. He was in Corinth when he wrote this letter. That's why he told the Corinthians. He said, I preach Christ. I preach Christ and he is a stumbling block to you Jews, a scandal. You just can't get over the fact that your Messiah would have died in such a horrific way. But that was God's plan. He was that lamb. He was slain. He was that Isaiah 53 fulfillment. Uh, going as a sheep to the slaughter. He is our hope. And so faith, faith, faith. And what we'll find in Romans chapter 10, over and over again, verse after verse after verse, it is the faith that we have in the finished work of Jesus that makes all the difference for eternity. Hope that helps. Uh, I look forward to seeing you on the other side. Romans chapter 10 and verse one. We'll talk about Paul's prayer again, an amazing prayer. And you'll see, I think, in greater context now that we've studied this great chapter, Romans chapter 9. God bless you.